Hey friends, January 2021, not a whole lot going on in terms of leaving the house since it is now freezing cold and also we can't go anywhere. So I watched a bunch of movies and then forced people I know to listen to me talk about those movies. So I thought instead, let me just record a video and get it all out at once. Um, so yeah, I also just got a letterbox account and I don't know why I didn't have a Letterboxd account the whole time. I've always kept track of the movies I watch, so this just makes it way easier to like collect my thoughts about them. So hopefully this video is somewhat coherent because of that. Um, yeah, I watched 10 movies in January. That's only counting movies that I watched for the first time. I'm not going to talk about any movies that I rewatched, mostly because I don't think anyone needs to hear me talk about like Grease or Shrek. Um, so we're just going to ignore those for the purpose of this video. Also, as I was watching movies this month, I decided to set up some rules for myself, I guess, in terms of what kinds of movies I'm going to try to watch this year. So I have three rules for the kinds of movies I want to watch every month. First one is to watch a movie that came out the month I'm watching it. Obviously because of the state of the world, that's likely going to mean movies that are coming out for streaming rather than in theaters, but it is what it is. Also, I am counting movies that like technically came out a few months earlier or even a year earlier during festivals, but only became available to wider audiences the month I watched it. Pretty sure that's the case for like the two new movies I watched this month, but I'm counting them anyway. I'm obviously not going to film festivals, so that's the first chance I've had to watch them. Um, so that's rule number one. Rule number two is that I want to watch one horror movie every month. I think that I had never in my life seen a horror movie before last year. Um, I am scared of literally everything, but last year I watched like three or four horror movies, I guess, depending on what you count as horror. So I am trying to expand my horizons. I think it's a super interesting genre. I'm just terrified of it. So one a month seems possibly doable. I might be a little bit loose with the horror definition in terms of like horror versus thriller, but we're going to try. And then the third rule is that I want to watch at least one movie that came out before I was born per month. I just tend to watch more recent movies in general, so this will be a chance for me to like catch up on some classics that I've never seen or maybe just like find some movies that never crossed my radar because they're a little bit older. So yeah, those are the three rules I set for myself. Also, I'm not allowing myself to use one movie to fulfill two rules. So like the horror movie I watched this month came out before I was born, but it only gets to count as horror, no double dipping. So we'll see how that goes for me for the rest of the year. But without further ado, let's get into what I watched in January. The first movie I watched in January was The Sound of Metal that came out in 2019, although I believe it became available for wide audiences in 2020. It was directed by Darius Barter and I gave it a score of four stars. The movie stars Riz Ahmed as Ruben. He is a heavy metal drummer and a former addict whose life is turned upside down when he suddenly starts to lose his hearing. Riz Ahmed's performance is really the heart of the movie. It follows him all the way through, and I thought he did a phenomenal job. Obviously, it's a character who's going through a lot of upheaval and just emotional turmoil in general, and he's giving really 110%, especially in those like anguished, angry scenes, but also in like the quieter, more peaceful moments. And I thought he played all the layers of the character super well. Big props to him. I know he also learned ASL for the movie, which is pretty cool. Also really cool that they had members of the deaf community in the movie using ASL. I thought that was awesome. Um, another thing that I really liked in this movie was the sound design, which is not something I think that I'm normally aware of at all when I'm watching a movie, to be honest, but obviously the movie surrounds a character who's going deaf, and I loved the choices they made in terms of when we were hearing what Ruben would be hearing versus when we were hearing things as we would typically expect to hear them. The like switching back and forth really helped put us as the audience in Ruben's shoes, and I actually kind of felt like 
discombobulated after watching the movie because I'd gotten used to the sound going in and out. So I thought that was really cool. Um, I did have a couple issues with it storytelling wise. I didn't love the ending. I'm going to try really hard not to spoil any of the movies on this list in this video, so I'm very sorry that I'm going to be super vague when talking about the endings, but there was a part of the movie that was really a central part of it for about an hour, and then in the last 20 minutes, half an hour or so, it kind of just wasn't mentioned anymore, and I found that to be a little bit disappointing for how big a part of the movie it was. Um, I also thought it was interesting that Based on the promotional material, I thought it was going to be a big deal that he was going deaf because he was a musician, and that's definitely part of it, but it's more so a big deal because he's in a band with his girlfriend, Lou. Um, so I thought it was interesting that his emotional turmoil came from more of a romantic, personal place than a place of passion for music, but I do kind of wish they'd played up the music aspect a little bit more and meshed the two together. So those were my smaller criticisms, but like I said, I did really enjoy it, and especially for Riz Ahmed's performance, I think it's worth seeking out. The second movie I watched this month was Scream, so my horror movie for the month. Uh, Scream came out in 1996 and was directed by Wes Craven, and once again I gave it four stars. Um, I'm guessing most people like know the synopsis of Scream, but I'll give you the one sentence blurb anyway. It stars Nev Campbell as Sydney, a high schooler in a small town who begins to be stalked by a serial killer called Ghostface after he murders two of her high school classmates. Um, I had a really good time with this. It was a lot funnier than I expected to be. Um, it did a really good job balancing the laughs and the tension. Like, at first when it was funny, I was like, oh no, they're not gonna be able to make it scary too. But I think they did a really good job of making it both. Um, obviously the whole thing with Scream is that it's very meta. It's very aware of other horror movies and the tropes in them. And I really liked that tongue-in-cheek aspect, I think. For me, that's like perfect for a horror movie because it undercuts the scares a little bit. It's still a gory slasher movie, but it made it feel, I don't know, more like it's obviously a satire, but the way that they're like dropping little clues throughout to kind of sow doubt in your mind about who the killer is, it felt like a murder mystery with slasher elements more than a straight horror movie to me, which personally I really enjoyed. Um, I also liked the way they undercut some of the horror tropes that they were making fun of like all the girls who are attacked in this movie like put up good fights when they get attacked even if not all of them survive and I really appreciated that and I also have to give a shout out to um, Matthew Lillard's performance because I have no idea what he was doing but I loved it it was off the walls insane and it was so entertaining to watch so yeah Overall, I really enjoyed this movie. Obviously, like, there's not great character development, and it's kind of schlocky, which is why I didn't give it five stars, but that that's what it's supposed to be, and I had a really good time with it. Hopefully, starting off the year on the right foot for horror can continue that trend. All right, the third movie I watched was Ocean's 8. That came out in 2018 and was directed by Gary Ross, and I gave it a score of three stars. Um, I've seen Ocean's Eleven once, like, a few years ago, and I had a good time with it. Like, heist movies are fun in general. I did think this one dragged a lot in the first half. Um, oh, I didn't give a synopsis. I mean, you don't really need one. It's a heist movie. It's a group of eight women who are pulling off a jewelry heist at the Met Gala. That's the short and speed of it. Like I said... It's a heist movie, it's kind of what you expect it to be, but I did feel like it took a little bit too long to get into its rhythm for me personally, but I did have a lot of fun with the second half of the movie once they were actually pulling off the heist. I thought the humor was kind of forced, which is disappointing because you had some genuinely really funny actresses in there, like Aquafina and Mindy Kaling, or I find them really funny, and I thought... I think it was a fault of the writing more than the actors that the jokes just didn't land very well for me. And obviously a heist movie, the point is the heist, it's not the characters, but I thought there were a lot of seeds of character development kind of sprinkled throughout, so I was a little disappointed that 
those weren't developed more, especially the relationship between Sandra Bullock's character and Kate Blanchett's character. I was never really clear what their relationship was, and I would have loved to know more because I thought it was a really fun dynamic that the two of them had, and I wish the movie had done more with it. But for what it is, again, it's a heist movie. It's a good time figuring out how all the pieces are going to fit together, how they're going to get away with it, all of that. So I had a good time with it, just not my favorite overall. The fourth movie I watched was Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. This was a 2020 movie directed by George C. Wolfe, and I gave it four stars. Um, this movie is adapted from the August Wilson play of the same name. It stars Viola Davis as Ma Rainey, the mother of the blues, as well as Chadwick Boseman as the trumpet player in her band, and it focuses on a day that Ma Rainey and her band spend at a recording studio in Chicago. I personally liked the style of this movie. I It felt a lot like Fences. Again, that's adapted from an August Wilson play. And with both movies, I kind of heard the criticism that it feels like a play. Like, it feels like you're watching a play that was filmed as a movie. And I agree with that, but personally, I like it. Um, it works well for me. I think it really captures the intensity of the characters well that way. Um, that being said... I didn't love the overall story arc in this movie. I didn't think it came together super well until the very end. Before that, it just felt like character beat, character beat, character beat without a super strong through line. Um, so yeah, not my favorite in terms of story, but stylistically, I did really enjoy it and the performances were incredible. I mean, Chadwick Boseman, it makes you so sad to watch this movie and think that he's not going to be able to give another performance like this because this performance is absolutely incredible. He has this frenetic energy that really brings so much life to the movie, especially one that's so confined in one setting. He really brings it to life. He's so charismatic, but then he can flip his personality on a dime and it always makes sense for him to do so. I was just blown away by him in this movie. I loved him so much. I always love Viola Davis. I think she's like the best actress working today. Um, so I did enjoy her in this movie, even though Ma Rainey actually doesn't have that much screen time given that she's a titular character, but I did really like the contrast between her character and Chadwick Boseman's because I think they're very similar people, but while he is kind of off the walls, energetic, she is very stoic and sure of herself. And I really liked the dynamic that was playing out and cutting between the two of them. And like I said, I did think the end of the movie brought the whole thing together nicely uh, in terms of storyline and themes and character and all that. But up until then, it just felt a little bit disjointed for me, which is what prevented me from giving it five stars, even though I did really, really like it. All right. The next movie I watched was First Reformed. This is a 2017 movie directed by Paul Schrader, and I gave it two stars. Um, quick synopsis, this movie stars Ethan Hawke as Pastor Ernst, Ernest, Ernst, I don't know how you pronounce that, Toller. Um, he is a pastor who begins to question his faith after he becomes entangled in the lives of an environmental activist and his pregnant wife. I did not love this movie. I was in the mood to watch like a thriller and this was listed on the streaming service under suspense and I have rarely been more bored during a movie to be honest. I did not feel any suspense throughout it. Um, I thought the core concept at the heart of the movie was an interesting one. It's this man who's grappling with the fact of climate change and environmental disaster and wondering how that reconciles with his faith and I think that's really interesting and Ethan Hawke gives a good performance but it just it was so monotone to me like every scene felt exactly the same and there are some kind of shocking images in this movie but they elicited like no emotional response from me because it all just like looked and felt flat um yeah, and a lot of the thematic stuff was 
kind of really on the nose, which I'm not a fan of. I don't really like being beat over the head with a message in a movie, which I kind of felt like I was in this one until the end when it got super like abstract and ambiguous. So I thought that was kind of a weird switch halfway through. But yeah, mostly I was just disappointed by the lack of tension. Like I said, there are some objectively shocking things that happen, but they just didn't feel that shocking in the context of the movie. The most emotional reactions I had in this movie were to like this really weird, creepy lamp that they had in their apartment, which I'll put a picture of. And when he poured Pepto Bismol in his whiskey, like that was when I had the most, like, I don't know, tangible response to what was happening in the movie, which doesn't say a lot. That's great for this movie. I know a lot of people really like this one. It was nominated for best screenplay, I think, but yeah, just missed the mark for me. The next movie I watched was Promising Young Women, Young Woman, singular. Um, this came out in 2020 and was directed by Emerald Fennel. I gave this movie five stars. It was by far my favorite thing I watched this month. Um, it stars Carrie Mulligan as Cassie, a woman who is coping with a tragedy in her past by preying on men who try to prey on vulnerable women. I loved this movie. It was an emotional roller coaster ride in the best possible way. I laughed, I cried, I gasped, I had a great time with it, um, and then left it feeling literally like emotionally gutted. It really, really got to me. Um, I thought Carrie Mulligan is the perfect person to play this part. I saw an article that like some critics said she wasn't pretty enough to play this role, which one, what a ridiculous thing to say about anyone. Two, Carrie Mulligan is stunning. And three, she's perfect in this part. She has a really youthful face, but also a really mature voice. And that kind of contrast, I don't know, it's a natural part of who she is, but it worked so well for this girl who's stuck in the past and also trying to move forward with her life. I just loved her in this role. I loved Bo Burnham in this movie. Good for him. I The dialogue felt like it was written specifically for him to say. He is so funny, so charming in this movie. I love the two of their characters together. But also, the emotions and the suspense in this movie really drew me in. There's a couple of twists that I think I could have seen coming, but I was just so deeply invested in Cassie's character that... I wasn't thinking about them at all, so they did surprise me and they really got to me. I'm being super vague when I'm describing this movie because I really want people to watch it. I loved it so much. Also, I might make another video talking more about it in depth, but needless to say, I really recommend this one. Go seek it out. Um, I rented it, so it's not available for on Netflix or anything yet, but it's well worth your time. I really, really enjoyed it. The next movie I watched was One Night in Miami. This was one of the ones I'm counting as my new this month movie. It technically came out in 2020, but it became available in wide release on Martin Luther King Day. So uh, this movie was directed by Regina King and I gave it five stars once again. So this movie is adapted from a play of the same name and it imagines the conversations that happened on a night in 1964 that Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke spent together. Um, again, you can kind of feel that this is adapted from a play. It's that like one core location kind of movie. A lot of fast dialogue that's really the center of it and again that's a style that I personally really enjoy maybe not for everyone but this one did feel a little more cinematic to me than Ma Rainey's Black Bottom I thought it did a slightly better job of adapting the play format for the screen um, and huge props to Regina King for that I watched Watchmen pretty recently and loved her in that so when I found out she directed this movie she's awesome good for her um but also the performances in this movie across the board were phenomenal the only person I was super familiar with going into it was Leslie Odom Jr. who plays Sam Cooke and obviously great to hear him sing as Sam Cooke but he was also a phenomenal actor as well as the other three um 
Eli Gori, I hope I'm saying that right, who played Muhammad Ali, like, I thought he nailed that energy, like, so well, the confidence and the bravado, but then also the moments of vulnerability, I loved that from him. I also was really drawn to Aldous Hodge as Jim Brown, he's the figure in this movie who I knew the least about and I thought his performance was the most understated of the four and that really drew me in especially in the more heated and dramatic scenes when he was kind of the silent watcher I really liked watching him and seeing how he responded and then Kingsley Ben Adir as Malcolm X I know there was a little bit of controversy about having a Brit play Malcolm X but I thought again he was perfect in this role like Eli Gorey he played the highs and lows of the character so well where you got this sense of stoicism and calm and leadership from him but then also he had these moments of like intense anger and explosion and that dynamic was so cool to watch the dialogue before between all four men just created this amazing energy like when it comes down to it this movie is two hours of four men talking in a room but it doesn't feel like that because they're bringing so much to it and each of them is flawed like they're having an argument about their duties as public leaders and none of them are presented as giving a perfect argument or having perfect morals in the situation and I really liked that and obviously it goes without saying that this is a very relevant movie with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's going on in the country right now and I thought it did a really good job of presenting this nuanced argument amid all that and I think it's great that this movie was made this year and is available for wide audiences on Amazon Prime. Go watch it. It's an important conversation but also it's just really entertaining, amazing acting, good good movie. (laughs) I'm so bad at like summing up my thoughts in one sentence. This is probably so repetitive. I'm sorry. (laughs) The eighth movie I watched was Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Atomic Bomb. So this was my Before I Was Born movie. This movie came out in 1964, um, directed by Stanley Kubrick, and I gave it four stars. Again, it feels a little bit silly to give a synopsis of these like classic movies, but just to sum up, this movie is about when an American general decides to order a nuclear attack on the Soviet Union, the president and others in the war room must decide on the best course of action to prevent nuclear annihilation. Obviously, 1964, this came out at the height of the Cold War, so the satire was very timely um but it holds up like the satire is still really relevant even though obviously the nuclear arms race with the soviet union is not at the front of the collective consciousness right now a lot of the humor is still politically super relevant um which i was pleasantly surprised by i'd heard this movie it was like known as one of the great comedies and I was a little bit skeptical about how well the comedy would hold up but it did um and the performances were really fun Peter Sellers plays three roles in this movie and I thought he was good in all of them like very varied performances but I really enjoy enjoyed George C. Scott who is a general in the war room who has a very strong personality and opinions about what they should do in this situation I thought he was a lot of fun to watch um I've seen two Kubrick films I think other than this one and my complaint with both of them has been the pace I think his movies are so slow and at first I was kind of having that problem with this movie I thought it was dragging a little bit at the beginning especially in the scenes that are on the plane that's been ordered to drop the nuclear bomb but as the movie kept going I thought the pace picked up and it did a good job of building this like comedic tension so plus it's only like an hour and a half long so it got really snappy and kind of like wrapped up in the place that it should wrap up so I appreciated that from a Kubrick film in particular um obviously I know that this is like regarded as one of the great movies of all time and I give it four stars while I gave other movies on this list five stars I'm not saying that like Promising Young Woman is a better film than Dr. Strangelove. This is just my opinion. So this isn't like my favorite type of movie, but I really enjoyed it for what it was. And I was pleasantly surprised that I did. So yeah. 
the ninth movie I watched was Almost Famous. This came out in 2000. It was directed by Cameron Crowe, and I gave this movie five stars as well. It follows Patrick Fugit? Fugit? so bad with pronouncing names, I'm so sorry, um, as William, a young teen boy who dreams of becoming a rock and roll journalist and ends up going on the road with a rock band called Stillwater in order to get a story for Rolling Stone magazine. I enjoyed the heck out of this movie. I was smiling throughout. It was a really good time. Um, this is maybe like a little bit of a weird comparison, but it reminded me a lot of Little Miss Sunshine, which is one of my favorite movies, in just the like really funny, lighthearted, but also a really personal character study that had these heartfelt moments and the balance between those two things really working. Um, so I loved this movie. The performances were phenomenal. Um, obviously Kate Hudson and Frances McDormand are the ones who get a lot of attention for their performance in this Ah, performances in this movie and it is well deserved. I love Frances McDormand in anything but I really really liked her in this one and Kate Hudson perfect casting but I also loved Patrick Fugit who played William. He had this real innocence to him and like just felt like a young kid who was trying to figure, figure things out and it was so endearing to watch and I also really love Billy Crudup as the guitarist in Stillwater. I loved the relationships between all these main characters and how they were constantly changing in the movie. I'm really fascinated by the manic pixie dream girl trope in movies and its deconstruction in particular and I think this might be like the best deconstruction of it I've seen in a movie with Kate Hudson's character Penny Lane because it's so clear that all the guys view her as a Spanish pixie dream girl, but it is equally clear from like moment one that that is not what she is and I loved that. Like I said, I was just smiling the whole time. I couldn't believe I hadn't seen this movie before. I will definitely be watching it again. I thought it was really, really great. So entertaining, so sweet. Yeah, good one. Again, I don't know how to end talking about these movies. I'm so sorry, this is so awkward. But it's okay, because we're almost at the end. The tenth and final movie I watched this month was Pieces of a Woman. Again, technically a 2020 movie, but became available for wide audiences in 2021, so counts as a new movie in my book. Um, oh god, I should have looked up how to say this name. It was <laughs> directed by Cornel Mundruxo. So sorry. Um, but like I said, 2020 movie, and I gave it three stars. This movie stars Vanessa Kirby as Martha, a woman who has to deal with the fallout in her life after a tragedy during a home birth, and that fallout includes a lawsuit that's filed against a midwife who was present at the birth, as well as the deterioration of her relationships. Um, this movie started out really strong. I will also say it starts out with like a 25 minute birth sequence, which is hard to watch, but beautifully done. I thought it was so mesmerizing and I was like, I stopped breathing at one point watching the sequence just because I was so engrossed in it. And then unfortunately that momentum did not carry for me through the rest of the movie. So those first 30 minutes were definitely the highlight for me. Um, Vanessa Kirby is getting a lot of attention for her performance in this, and I think that's super well deserved. She's amazing. Her character doesn't say what she's thinking a lot, so it rides a lot on Vanessa Kirby's ability to convey that without her words, and I think she's excellent, but I don't think the movie serves her character super well. Um, it spends a lot of time focused on Sean, her partner, and I don't think his storyline pays off super well, So, and it's not super well developed either, so it ends up with these two main characters and neither of their storylines are as developed as I would have liked, so I wish they had just made it Martha's story and focused more on her than on Sean. I will also say, not the fault of the movie, but given the timing of it, it is 
really difficult to watch Shia LaBeouf in this role as Sean, um, given the allegations made against him recently. So again, not the movie's fault, but I did find that really hard and that might have colored the way that I was viewing Sean's character and why I wasn't super invested in his storyline. So I will give that caveat that I may be coming at it with a little bit of a biased perspective. Still though, I had some problems with this movie in terms of the pacing. Like I said, those first 30 minutes really grabbed me and the next hour and a half I felt never reached that same emotional height, which was kind of hard. Um, and also because it starts with the birth and this tragedy and then deals with the fallout for the rest of the movie, you never get a sense of what the relationships were like before the tragedy. And so it's hard to know how much this deterioration is because of what happened and how much of it was already kind of in the works beforehand. This, there's a lot of symbolism in this movie too that's like so on the nose. There's a lot of symbolism with bridges and with apples in particular that it's like, oh my god, we get it. And in a movie where the main character is so quiet and like allowed to be this introspective character it felt so strange to also get it like hit over the head repeatedly with the symbolism so I didn't love the way it all came together um and the lawsuit as well is a big part of the movie but it goes in and out of the plot so much that I was kind of confused by it a lot of the time I don't know much about midwifery or childbirth to be fair but like I didn't even get the basis of the lawsuit until the very end of the movie so I found it hard to wrap the whole story together cohesively in my mind um that being said like I said Vanessa Kirby astounding performance in this big props to her and I think it is bringing up a lot of important points about a woman's bodily autonomy and what it's like to go through this trauma in childbirth and also like her relationship with her mother plays a part in that too so I thought all that was really good ideas I just didn't think they were executed as well as they could have been so yeah, those are the 10 movies I watched in January. Um, hopefully now my friends will not be as annoyed with me talking about movies to them constantly because it's all condensed in this lovely little video form. Um, let me know if you have any recommendations about what I should watch in February, particularly horror movies that are not super scary. That would be great. I'm definitely looking forward to Judas and the Black Messiah, which is coming out in February. And also I think Nomadland is coming to Hulu. So looking forward to that a lot as well. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.